Welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Banks and I'm here with my partner Pam Krulitz. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we are co-founders and partners at Optify, a leadership development company. And we believe that leadership coaching is the edge in today's complex environment. And if we can expand the reach of one-on-one -on -one coaching to more leaders in our organizations, they can have impact beyond what's ever been possible before. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Pam and we're gonna to talk today about how you can leverage coaching to drive your organization's strategic objectives. Pam? Thank you, Lisa. We're very excited to be here with you today and um, to have this important conversation at an important time. It feels like we're, we're at a little bit of a tipping point right now in, um, in how we're thinking about our organizations. And we're very excited to, to talk with you about um, driving organizational success through leadership coaching. My uh, background is that I've been a coach for 17 years. I've worked one-on-one -on -one with people at all levels of organizations, with leaders, particularly around leadership um, topics, and um, am passionate about coaching and what it can do both for individuals and for organizations. And uh, founded Optify a couple of years ago with Lisa and our other partner, Chris, to um, bring that one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching experience to more people in organizations to, to drive organizational success. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna get started here. And the first, um, first thing I really, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you are facing in your organizations today. And we are out talking with a lot of folks on a regular basis and hear lots of stories and are, are sort of tapped into, um, broadly speaking, what some of those trends are. But we would love to hear from you and just putting into the chat, what are the maybe one or two top challenges that you're facing from a leadership or talent development or talent management um, standpoint in your organization? If you could just put in one or two things, that would be great. Yeah, pop them in the chat. And by the way, we'll be um, fielding questions from the chat function as well. So as we go along today, uh, don't be shy, put things in the chat um, for us to see. And we'll try to save some time at the end for question and answer as well. Yeah. All right, we're not seeing much show up here. So I wonder if maybe people don't have access to chat. We will, um, we will share with you what we've been seeing and talking with a lot of clients about lately. Um, the first thing I wanna say is I think we all should, yeah, preparing leaders to manage and lead the change. Yep, that's, that's what a lot of, a lot of organizations are about um, right now. But I, I actually think that we should start by just giving ourselves a pat on the back for what we've all been through over the last year. I mean, certainly, um, when we were sitting here a year ago, last April, um, I'm not sure we could have anticipated what, um, what has transpired over the last year. And certainly we all um, have overcome a lot. And as we're seeing with our clients, I think resilience has been an all time high. I think everyone's felt the impact of what's been happening. And at the same time, found ways around it and through it. And it's been rocky and bumpy, but at the end of the day, we're all, here on the other side of it. So I think we, um, we should acknowledge what we've, what we've been through and, um, and what we've learned and grown from it. Um, yeah, engagement from a virtual standpoint, we're gonna be talking about that as well. That's a, a real, interesting, real interesting question. Um, how do we re-engage now that we've been um, virtual for the last year? So good questions. Good. I think we're gonna to touch on both of those as we talk. Um, so as you can see on the slide, the accelerating pace of change, I, you know, honestly, I think we started talking about the accelerating pace of change 10 years ago and, um, you know, everybody thought, well, it certainly can't keep up at the same pace as it's always been. It has to slow down at some point. A lot of it was technology driven. And I think what we've seen in the last year is honest to goodness, it is, um, change now in every dimension of our lives. It's not just technology-driven change, but 
Um, changes in where we work, certainly. Um, changes in how we work. Changes in what we're working on. Um, organizations have made so many pivots over the last year in response to COVID that um, have to do with the, the product set that we're pursuing or how we're developing products, how we're collaborating and interacting with each other. It just seems like not only is the change continuing to accelerate, but it's affecting more and more parts of our organizations and our lives. And I don't think that's going to change. It's not, you know, I think we most of us have come to sort of accept that change is a fact of life. And now the question is, how do we make sure that we're adapting to it? And how are we resilient in the face of the change that's happening? Um, but it's certainly a, a present part of everyday life in organizations um, for all of us. The other thing that we notice as we're out talking with organizations about leadership, about their strategy, about talent development, um, is certainly this notion of hybrid work. I think a year ago, we were just sitting down and getting comfortable working on Zoom and figuring out Slack so that we could talk to our coworkers instead of peeking around the corner or the cubicle, we could just Slack a quick message to find out what was going on. Um, and it seemed like just as we all got sort of settled into our routines and I don't know about you, but I'll throw a breast, chicken breast in the crock pot in the middle of the day to make sure my dinner's ready at the end of the day. You know, I can do that because it's right outside my, my office door now. You know, we've adapted to this work from home, work remotely, virtual environment. And just as we've sort of settled into all of our routines here now, we're at the point where we can start thinking about going back into the office again and what that might mean and how are we going, how are we going to go into the office and when are we going to go into the office and why would we be going into the office and the things that we used to take for granted about working um, working in an office environment, we don't take for granted anymore. And most people have found that they want some type of balance between that experience in the office, in person, working with their colleagues in that kind of collaborative way that happens in a, in a physical um, space together and still want the flexibility of being able to hop on Zoom or work from home more frequently or um, take calls you know, in, in this way, so you don't have to travel and fight traffic and all of that. So I think we're, we're all um, really facing that question now of what does that hybrid environment look like? How are we um, engaging with people in the most optimal way while providing flexibility? And, you know, I, I'm not sure there's any one right answer. I think every organization is finding their way through this by considering the job that needs to get done, what level of collaboration is optimal, um, where people are traveling from. You know, if you're in a, in a city with a lot of traffic, there are certainly other considerations. If you don't have, if your, your folks don't face as many considerations for traffic, you might be more, more interested in bringing people back to the, I mean, there's so many variables that are coming into play that are important considerations. And, um, and it's one that we're gonna be facing and leadership throughout organizations is going to be, it's not just an HR decision. It's not just a senior leadership decision. It's really an organizational decision and, and adjustment and transition that's gonna to need to take place. The other thing that we have seen, um, I, as I'm sure you have um, up front and center over the last year is this really looming question and consideration and thought around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I think many organizations right now are, are very focused on figuring out how do, we, how do we create a more diverse workforce? How do we leverage the diversity in our, um, in our workforce? How do we make sure our, our environment and culture is inclusive and equitable? A lot of questions coming up around DEI. And um, at the end of the day, there are organizational considerations, there are policies and practices, and how do you if, consider DEI in all facets of, um, of your, your policies and practices and your culture. Um, and it's a very individual journey that a lot of us have been on as well in considering um, 
from a leadership standpoint, how are we leading in a more inclusive way? And um, I think that's going to continue. So there's a there's a strong systems dimension or organizational dimension, and there's a very personal dimension to it as well that um, that needs to be considered. Um, the next thing that we hear quite a bit as we're out and about talking with clients is that, um, especially now as we're coming out of the pandemic, a lot of organizations are facing the, the, the upside of that, right? What is the, the next stage of growth look like for their organizations where some had maybe trimmed back or flattened out over the last year? They're sort of seeing now some of the growth needs bubbling and um, that by definition requires that you have a pipeline of people who are going to be ready, uh, ready to fill into leadership positions. If you're growing as an organization, you have to grow your leadership fence so you have the leadership strength to, um, to accelerate and support the growth of your company. So um, there's, a, there's a real need and focus as we're seeing on creating those ready now leaders, making sure that you're, that pipeline is full ready to support the business. And then the last thing that we found is that um, over, particularly over the last year, and I think there's a generational dimension to this as well, but there are a number of companies that are really in this question about how do we create a healthy organizational culture? Um, certainly new generations of people coming into the workforce are looking for more purpose in their work. They're looking for um, being able to see the humanity in their colleagues and in the, in the practices of the organization. Um, I think we've all felt that in, and maybe more acutely during COVID because we haven't been able to work together in person. And, um, and I think that, that hum the humanity of your colleagues um, becomes a much bigger question. How do you see people as human beings? Certainly we've seen pets wandering across screens and kids popping in and out. So I think in some ways that that humanity has become even more prominent as we've all been working from home and seeing a little glimpse into, into people's lives. Um, and how do we maintain that? How do we accelerate and continue to see um, the humanity and people and the purpose in what we're doing. You know, if we're gonna spend eight or 10 or more hours a day doing this thing we call work, how do we make sure that it has a purpose, that we can clearly see that purpose and that um, we feel like we're contributing some to something larger than ourselves. Um, and this has been one of the books on my shelf back there is Conscious Capitalism. I think this notion has been around for a while, but I think it's even accelerated during the last year of the pandemic when, um, you know, organizations just serving shareholders isn't really isn't really working um, anymore. It's not what's being called for. Um, and so how can organizations make that shift into that new way of working, that new mentality, the new mindset of a more humane and um, balanced place to work that's considering shareholder needs, customer needs, employee needs, community needs all at the same time. So those are a few of the, the sort of the macro trends that we're seeing right now. And whenever we see these trends in organizations, the question becomes, how do, we, how do we adapt to them? How do we change? How do we make sure that the organization can really um, take advantage of, benefit from um, some of the, the changes in the broader dynamics of, of work these days? And um, our belief and having coached for 17 years and sat across the, the desk, either in person or virtually with hundreds and hundreds of leaders, um, have, we have all seen that, that need for not just the systemic view and the systemic changes um, in structure or technology or tools or processes, but that real human individual need for change as well. And our belief is that when you can provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to large numbers of people across an organization, um, particularly that, that mid-level of leadership, you can really affect organizational change um, much more quickly and, and make sure that it's adapted, adopted in a um, healthier way. 
So we believe that one of those important levers to pull when you're thinking about change, when you're thinking about the direction of your organization is, is one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, it has historically been reserved for fairly senior people or in sort of one-off situations, but our contention is that it can be an important um, lever and part of organizational change initiatives. Um, and this is not just us who are seeing this and believing this, the International Coach Federation um, has done research, and this came out, I think about a year or two ago, that in ICF's findings, um, they're seeing uh, coaching, leadership coaching, being used by more people in more ways, um, leveraged to develop not only just individuals, but teams and organizations at the systemic and cultural level as well. So there is a shift to seeing coaching as a more strategic way of accelerating, um, accelerating change across organizations. So Lisa is going to talk a little bit more about how that happens, why that happens, how coaching can be a modality, if you will, or an intervention that can support organizational effectiveness and organizational change. Thanks, Pam. Um, so as Pam was saying, one of the levers that you can pull in order to help your organization adapt to some of these really um, large challenges is to bring one-on-one -on -one coaching into your organization. And the reason that one-on-one -on -one coaching is so impactful is that it's personalized because these, uh, the issues that Pam was just talking about, these are not really about um, read a book, you know, build a new skill, um, you know, take a class issues. These are nuanced issues that really get to the hearts and minds of the people who work in your organization. And so we believe that one-on-one -on -one coaching is really the best way to, to tap into the minds and hearts of your leaders and to help them unlock their best selves the other thing that, that we believe is that when coaching is provided in a scaled way, an organization can set a strategic objective and say, we want to bring coaching in in a scaled way to affect these particular and help us reach these particular objectives. But then the coaching itself is one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a one-size-fits-all, because as you've probably learned in trying to bring training and development to um, the individuals in your organization, um, people learn in different ways, they are stuck in different areas. And so what we thought it would be helpful to do is talk about, you know, why is coaching a great intervention? And, you know, the big headline is that um, change is hard. Um, you know, we are, we are wired for the status quo. And so, you know, here's four items that we're going to talk about um, in a little bit more detail. One, you know, we're just, we're wired for status quo. Two, um, we don't like being told there's something wrong with us and that, you know, we, we have to change. That, that causes us to be defensive and dig our heels in. Um, and sometimes we have this sense that, oh, it'll be easy. I'll just um, follow this recipe and all of a sudden be, you know, a great leader. And then finally, you know, a commitment, right? We don't have a way of holding ourselves accountable. So we believe that coaching addresses all of these issues in a way that training simply cannot. So as I said, we are wired for um, things to stay as they are. Just think about the last time you tried to lose a couple pounds. You know, it seems like our bodies have a certain set weight and no matter whether we go up or lose weight for a while, we kind of tend to get back to the exact same spot. It's really frustrating. Um, and, and it's very similar with our mindsets um, and consequently our behaviors. And so research shows that 95% of our, our behaviors are on autopilot. We do them because we always have, and we continue to get the same results we always have. I mean, think about the way you run a meeting. You probably set up your agenda the same way. You arrange your day the same way. You probably approach conflict similarly. 
Um, you often might find yourself taking the same position on issues in your organization. You know, either you're the, um, the one who agrees or you're the one who is the skeptic or you're the one who's the, you know, the innovator. And we don't stop to consider alternatives until we have someone challenging us and challenging our thinking and inviting us to pause and consider what else is possible and how might other ideas and others' ideas and perspectives improve what we're doing? So coaching at its core really, really builds a client's self-awareness. And this is the number one um, gateway to change is self-awareness, knowing what your internal emotional state is, your mental states, really understanding with clarity and honesty your strengths and weaknesses and your triggers. When are you at your best if you're really, really honest? And when do you get reactive? You know, when do you feel that resistance and that defensiveness showing up? Um, with a coach, you can start to investigate what are the circumstances that really um, cause me to be reactive? Um, and another thing is about, you know, with coaching, how might we consider others' perspectives? And this gets back to that question around inclusivity. You know, so much talk about an inclusive business environment is proven to be more innovative, better ideas are coming out. Um, these organizations are thriving and moving faster when they're considering different perspectives. So if your leaders are kind of stuck in, in their own perspective and they don't have a coach really challenging their thinking, they can get, they can, you know, put the fingers in the ears and say, you know, no, it's my way or the highway. So a coach can really challenge a client's status quo thinking. And we do this as coaches by asking our clients to slow down and question their habitual behaviors and always to ask the question, how might I be wrong? What else might be true? And so when clients examine their habits and behaviors, they can determine what's working, what's not. And this is not always possible if you don't have a trusted relationship in which to have an honest conversation. So a coach provides that really trusted space where you can kind of let it all hang out and say, well, I really dug my heels in here and I wish I hadn't and this was the result and, and the coach might prod, okay, what else could be possible and how else might you handle this next time? And, you know, why don't we, um, why don't you design a practice that you can just test out your theory about how you could stay in, an, in a conversation without getting defensive? And so ultimately with increased self-awareness, clients are able to choose differently and choose skillfully. They can really respond to what's in front of them with more choice. No longer do the situations that used to trigger them um, hook them every time, but they see it coming. They notice how they feel and, and what's about to happen and they're able to choose differently. So with coaching, there's an opportunity to really, as a leader, become the master of your world and to see that change is possible. And then of course, it's a snowball effect. Once we realize that we can shift our mindsets and practice new behaviors, it all starts to come together and build a lot of confidence for leaders. And so leaders tell us, a couple of things they tell us about this coaching relationship is that it really helped them to slow down and reflect on their behavior and what was working and what wasn't. Because frankly, we don't take the time to reflect. We just act and act and act. So it's really important for leaders to have that, that designated space with a coach in order to really reflect. And secondly, they tell us that they used to believe that they didn't have choice. Well, I have to do this and I have to do that. And once they've gone through their coaching engagement, they really understand, oh, I am the master of, of my choices. And it's, it's a really empowering way of being in it. As I said, it builds a lot of confidence. And as Pam was saying, that word resilience comes up over and over again for individuals. And as you might imagine, a training class really can't address this. 
um, if I come home from a training and we've all done it, I've done it myself. And I've been so excited about what I learned. I was immersed in something and I came home with this, you know, cheat sheet of what I'm going to do. And I get so excited and I implement those new practices for a week or two. And I tell everybody, we're going to do this now. and We're going to run our meetings this way. And then I kind of forget about it or I get busy or, um, you know, I haven't really changed my mindset because I haven't really figured out how to make this new learning work for me so that I can apply it in the flow of work. So that's the beauty of coaching is that you're really examining your mindsets and you're, you're challenging the status quo and you're learning how to apply new thinking, new behaviors in the flow of work rather just than just in a training class where it's all theoretical and all sounds so easy. You know, who's watched a cooking show and, and watched, you know, Julia Child whip up beef bourguignon and said, oh, that looks so easy. And then you try to do it yourself. You're like, whoa, wait, you know, what's braising? What's this? So um, with a coach, you're really getting to understand how to make that recipe over and over again. So the second reason that change is hard and, and how coaching can support it is that we resist being told to change. We are wired again for self-protection. Our ego has a story about who we are and we want to protect that. And, and frankly, we look for evidence um, that we're okay just as we are. And so sometimes if we're told we're going to have a leadership development opportunity, we might be very skeptical at first. First, wait a minute. Am I expected to change? Do I need to be different than I am? Um, does that mean I'm not a good leader? This feels really, really threatening. And we resist this. And we think, well, I've been doing well so far. I like how I do it. Um, and we really can't see the cost of our behaviors. So luckily, coaching is a strength-based intervention. It really jumps off from where the client is and says, OK, here's where you are and it's working, right? It's working, uh, tell me how it's working. Okay, how might it not be working? You know, what might, might be possible if you could shift in a certain way? And coaching asks the client to consider what might be. So meeting a client where they are is such an empowerment uh, tool because that's the paradox of change. In order to shift, we have to be seen and accepted just as we are. You know, just think about your partner. We want, you know, we want our partners to see, you know, all of us, right? The, the good parts, the bad parts, the warts, the, you know, the things we're not so proud of, and they love us anyway. So, and then we're able to consider shifting. So with a coach and client relationship, the, the coach comes in without judgment, and so the client can relax and really see themselves a little bit more clearly. That no judgment piece is really, really valuable. And it allows the coach to hold up a mirror. The other thing is a coach has no dog in the hunt, as we say. The client is free to choose as they wish. Um, you know, we have clients who at first dismiss feedback that they get um, from a 360 and they say, this is just, you know, BS, right? The, this was uninformed. This person doesn't know what they're talking about. And that may be true. And we always get to choose what we want to do with the information. But with time and a trusted relationship, they might consider, well, what if this were true about me? Is this how I would want others to experience me? And now they can open up to possibility. And with coaching, there's also um, this, this whole piece around gathering feedback um, very honestly. And as I said, you know, talking about, okay, what do you think about this feedback? What, what are you curious about? What resonates with you and what doesn't? And so with coaching, uh, we can really leverage the client's strengths and we can expand their abilities and we can help them evolve, not change. The point is not to, to tell leaders that they have to change. It's actually to help them evolve because leadership is a thing. It's a journey and it, um, it is a lifetime experience. And there's always more to learn and more to expand into. So um, everything that the client needs is within themselves and uh, the, coach is there to really help them build 
um, that confidence so they can, they can really pull those levers of remarkable leadership. And again, as you can imagine, a training class or uh, an intervention can't address this. Because if I think I'm okay and I haven't had that conversation with a coach where I can, in all honesty, say, oh, well, maybe I am showing up a little bit aggressively, I can just simply tune out the training and say, oh, well, this class was, you know, given to all of our uh, managers at this level, but it's not for me. I'm all good here. So um, with coaching, you really do shine a light on um, what's true and consider what's possible. So another reason why change is hard is because we think it's easy. You know, we told, we're told, okay, um, your communication style is a little edgy and a little abrupt and, and people are um, feeling that it's a bit aggressive. And so we say, okay, well, I'm going to go get a book on effective communication. What's so hard about that? I'll read a book and, or I'll uh, read an article and I'll just follow the steps. And, you know, then nothing changes. And we wonder, you know, why hasn't anything changed? or we try to take such massive changes all at once, we try to boil the ocean um, and they're completely unsustainable. And our, our teams have no idea what we're doing, right? We're trying this on one day and trying something on another day. And so with coaching, we're setting concrete goals that um, if, a, if a client says, I want to improve my communication, then we're really asking them, okay, what would success look like? What would you be doing? Well, how would you be communicating if you were able to achieve this new goal? And so there's a lot of conversation that goes into setting goals versus this very general uh, you know, edict of, I'm going to be a better communicator. Well, what does that mean for you as the leader? What are you going to be saying and doing? What are others going to be experiencing from you? What does it look like if you're a better communicator? And so in setting those concrete goals, the client really has to consider the, the nitty gritty of what it's going to look like. And they may set a goal to just practice two new behaviors, right? Um, I will pause before I answer. And I will consider to myself, you know, how else might others be able to add in this conversation? Or I might decide to practice that in every meeting, I'm going to speak last. I'm going to let my team speak first so that I can hear their ideas. And I'm going to really consider them before I say what I think we should do. Or I will um, say, here's what I think we should do. Poke holes in it for me. Tell me how I'm wrong. So those goals are really concrete. Coaching also emphasizes this experimentation, which I was just talking about. So with a coach, you can design these practices and then your work world is just your laboratory and you get to try out new ways of being. And that's how you start to see what works, what doesn't work. Oh, I'm gonna try this on and it's working for me and I'm gonna keep doing it. Or, oof, that was a total bust in that meeting. It just felt completely flat. I'm gonna go back to the drawing board and create a new practice with my coach. And then coaches um, really help clients figure out their limiting beliefs. What are the stories that tell, we tell ourselves that are driving the behaviors? So if we are aggressive and we're always telling our team what the answer is and how it will be, and we're not stopping to pause and invite them into the conversation, we might have a story that leaders are the ones who know all the answers. And you can imagine that no matter how much I try to practice inviting other people's opinions in, if I have a belief that it's a leader's job to have all the answers and that leaders you know, good leaders are the ones who have all the answers, there is not a chance that I am really going to invite in other opinions and have a robust discussion about it. So when a coach can help a client uncover that uh, limiting belief, then we can start to change behaviors. And again, training doesn't address this. These are long conversations. Um, and, you know, if I read the one, two, three, four about good communication, that's not going to get at my inner game and help me to um, really practice changing that mindset around, oh, great leaders are the ones 
who invite all of the ideas and, and are a champion of the best ideas, which is usually a collaboration of everyone's ideas, not just the leaders, right? Let themselves off the hook. And then finally, the reason the change is hard, because we don't have an accountability device. Left to our own devices, we just often can't engage in the iterative practice, feedback, assess, reassess loop that's required for real change. We don't have these conversations with ourselves. So with coaching, um, you get that consistent feedback loop. Every time you meet with your coach on a consistent basis, you, you're talking about what worked, what didn't work. Um, and coaches will really tell the truth. And, and they'll say, oh, sounds like, you know, you didn't like the way that worked. What would you, what do you wish you had done differently? And, and what could, what else could we design for you? And coaches will make observations about what they're seeing. For instance, you know, we often have clients who say, this is my goal. I want to be X. And yet week after week, they come in and tell us a story about why. And the coach is going to say, okay, you say you want X, but you keep showing up with the story about why, what's up there, right? What's really in the way of you making sustainable change? And the art of a great coach is to know when to support, when to be your cheerleader, and when to really push and just say, I gotta say, I, I'm just you know seeing this, this, or this, right? What are you seeing? What do you think about that? So coaches um, lean to the supportive side because we're the champion of your goals, but we really have to ask the challenging questions. And in my own experience as a coach, um, I really am very supportive and I love to see my clients grow. But I will tell you, when I ask a challenging question that makes my client deeply uncomfortable, that's the question then they come back to me two weeks later and say, that was everything right? That shifted things for me. And so coaches have that ability to ask the, com the question that will make a client deeply uncomfortable. And they will just have to sit in that question around what really is getting in my way. And then of course, coaching, because usually we um, suggest a six month coaching engagement, it's consistent, right? It's every two weeks, I'm going to meet with my coach over a sustained period of time. And it's the consistency that really builds new patterns of, of being. Um, and then finally, the coach provides this trusted sounding board. Some clients, um, you know, really just need to noodle around in, in new ideas and they just want a sounding board. Other clients are hoping to build new skills and they really want some structure around how they can build a new skill. But this accountability partner is really, really important. So we, we've talked about why coaching supports change because change is hard. But I think what's really important is, you know, you're thinking, okay, we want coaching for our organization. How do we bring this to our organization um, in, a, in a way that can really impact our organizational objectives? And so how do we bring them into the organization? Luckily, coaching in your organization can take many forms and there are a number of doorways in. And Pam is gonna share our view on um, what coaching looks like in action in lots of different organizations. Cause there's again, not one size fits all. Pam? Yeah, thanks Lisa. That was great. And what a great glimpse you provided into um, what it's like to be in a coaching relationship. So if you haven't had a coach before, really understanding what that experience is and how the coach helps individuals shift and sort of tying it back to what I was talking about at the beginning, if you can um, enable and support your leaders on an individual level in making some of those shifts that are going to help them be more successful and be more um more in tune with themselves or um, lead, as we talked about at the beginning, lead more inclusively or lead from a, uh, a more humane perspective. Once you start doing that and seeing that in individual cases and you can accelerate it across the organization, that's when the real true organizational impact is gonna happen. 
So it starts at the bottom at that very individual, get in there and noodle around with a coach to make some important shifts for yourself as a leader. And then those shifts are going to ripple out to the rest of the organization. So the question then becomes, how do you actually do that? How do you bring coaching into an organization? And we've developed a bit of a maturity model around that very question. Um, I think there's a uh, maturity model for just about everything these days. You know, there are a lot of them out there and we have um, pulled this one together just based on our experience in working with a lot of organizations around talent development, leadership development, leadership coaching. So this is really a maturity model around what we've seen, how we've seen organizations mature their coaching or leadership development function um, over time in order to truly have that sort of organizational impact. And um, at early stages in organizations, the coaching becomes very, it's sort of ad hoc. There, and most organizations start out this way and it can work very well for organizations. So just because it's stage one doesn't mean it's bad. It, it's actually what could be very, very much needed in certain organizations, depending on your context, depending on your goals, your objectives, your strategies, um, providing ad hoc coaching may be exactly the right answer. Um, but what it looks like at stage one in, in ad hoc coaching is Let's just identify a, a few people. Perhaps an HRBP is working with a senior leader who isn't quite getting the traction with it, their team that they need to, or isn't quite getting this diversity and equity and inclusion um, model that we're trying to instill in the entire organization. So let's just identify individuals who may benefit from coaching bring in a coach for them, probably know people, there may be a little networking involved, but let's just find a coach and, um, and provide support to individual leaders in that kind of way. It can be, it can be fairly ad hoc. And again, that might be the right answer in some cases. Um, stage two, a lot of organizations when they've been doing this ad hoc coaching for a while find, wow, we don't, I've talked to organizations before who've said, yes, we do coaching, but we don't really know even how many people have coaches. We don't know how they're finding coaches. We don't even know how much they're paying for coaching. It's all very decentralized and it may be working, but we just actually don't even know the answer to that. We don't know how much we're spending on it. We don't know the return that we're getting, right? A lot of questions. And so they start to develop a little bit more of a coordinated infrastructure. And this is usually in some sitting somewhere in HR, talent development, learning and development, there's usually um, a function within HR that will start doing a little bit more to coordinate the coaching that's happening across an organization. Obviously depends on the size of the company and the, the organizational structure of the company where, where that sits and how it works. But there's usually this second stage that where coaching becomes more coordinated. At least we know who's getting coaches and, and how and why. And then organizations will very often, once they get their arms around that and they say, okay, now we understand who's getting coaching, um, how much we're spending on it. We still don't really know if we're getting any benefit from it. We, we aren't measuring outcomes. You know, We kind of hear from coaches or clients that they're getting a lot out of it, but it's anecdotal. And so there's this um, stage of maturity that organizations go through where they begin to think more about measuring the impact. So measuring both the success of the coaching, the um, getting feedback on the coaches themselves to see who are, who are the coaches who are the best fit for different um, leaders in the organization. And then truly what is the impact? You know, this gets to that big question of ROI, right? How do we measure the ROI of coaching? And it requires some coordination and it requires a disciplined process to be able to um, to measure and assess impact and results of coaching. Um, but that's usually that next stage. And then we see that as organizations do that, they start to become a little bit more strategic about coaching. They start asking those bigger questions like we started off with today. How can coaching really support the needs of this organization um, strategically. Our talent, what are our talent needs in order to support the business strategy? 
And how can we make coaching or leadership development a part of our talent development strategy in order to really impact and how do we tie it then to the business um, business strategy and business needs. So there's a there's a more strategic approach to um, to coaching. There's a more um, bigger picture, broader picture. There's usually engagement of more stakeholders in the conversation to lay out the overall objectives of coaching um, and to make sure it's really aligned with the business. And then the last stage of development. And there are a few organizations that are moving in this direction that um, where coaching now becomes less of something we do for people. It's not necessarily getting external coaches or developing internal coaching programs, but it's actually making coaching and development a part of the fabric of the organization. So um, organizations, um, they're called deliberately developmental organizations or how, you know, organizations that embed learning in everything that they do. Um, they may have a practice at the end of each meeting to ask people, what did you learn from this meeting? And it just embeds that culture that learning is an important part of what we're doing. We're not just out there getting results all the time. We're also learning and growing as we do it. Um, everyone in the organization may have a mentor or a coach internal to the organization. It could be that all leaders have as one of their key objectives, the development of their staff, the development of people on their teams, um, because that's a critical part of becoming a learning organization. So when organizations get to that stage five, it really becomes part of the, the inner workings and integral. It's not just a, a program that's done separate to the, the needs of the organization. So, um, we see a lot of organizations aspiring to that, some doing it, some doing it well and moving in that direction. And, um, and it's terrific to see. And, um, and some who are at different stages because that's exactly where their organization needs them to be. And, um, and sometimes when there are external changes that are now putting, placing new demands on the organization, moving into a more um, coordinated or measurable or strategic approach to coaching might might be exactly what an organization needs. So that's that's how we think about the maturity model. Again, a lot of different a lot of different models out there, but um, in our experience, that's what we've seen. And we actually see four pillars of um, maturation. So four things that help organizations move through those stages if that's what they're interested in doing. And um, one is obviously strategy. So the more strategically an organization can approach the, the learning need, the coaching need, again, engaging more stakeholders, having those more strategic conversations about who we want to develop, why we want to develop them, and what capacities do we want to develop in those, in those um, in those folks is, is that first element. So becoming more strategic is a critical piece of it. And then becoming more structured. You know, what, it, what has an organization found is the right structure for a coaching engagement or for leadership development, or what is the cadence that they believe people should be engaging in these coaching conversations, whether it's with an internal coach or their boss or an external coach. What does that structure look like? What is the, the structure of um, feedback that they're going to be getting? Are they seeking quarterly feedback? Are they seeking annual feedback from colleagues and peers? Are they sharing their goals? Or are they um, just sharing their goals with their manager? Are they sharing them more broadly? What is the structure that um, is going to work best for the organization in terms of developing leaders? And then the third pillar is measurement. And we talked about this as part of the maturity model, but how do you actually measure um, the success of coaching in engagements and coaching endeavors. Um, if you think about what happens at the end of coaching, what, how do you know what changes have been made? Are you going to be getting, we do one process called degree of change where we have clients reach out to their colleagues and say, how much change have you noticed and what impact has that had? It's a fabulous question to get feedback from all the way around. Or is it something that you wanna measure just internally um, or have the, the leaders who are being coached measure for themselves or report out for themselves? 
but we'll ask questions as we're measuring success about, did this change the engagement level of your team? Did this change um, the way you are, the innovation that you are bringing to your, your product development initiatives, right? What is the real impact that it had? And that's the measurement part. And then the fourth component of uh, maturation is scale. So how do you make sure that you can bring coaching to a lot of people? And there are, in coaching engagements, there are just a lot, we call it a lot of moving parts, right? You're matching people up together, you're structuring programs, you're making sure they're scheduling, that they're getting the feedback, that you're measuring results. A lot of moving parts to it and being able to scale that so that you can reach dozens or hundreds even of leaders in the organization is no small task. And so it's an important part of thinking about how you, um, how you scale coaching programs so that they can then have that type of organizational impact. So that's, um, yes. yeah, that's how we think about it. So Lisa? Yeah, thanks, Pam. And if anybody, we have a couple minutes left. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or you can always reach us at optifycoaching.com or we'll show our, our emails. But the last thing I wanted to share about this scaling piece is that in order to scale coaching across your organization, we really have to leverage technology today. And um, I loved this finding by the McKinsey Capacity Building 2030 report, which basically said in the future, the most successful organizations will develop the skills of their workforce by harnessing the power of technology and linking capacity building with business values. So that's what we were talking about, that strategic piece. And then making talent development a CEO level priority. So we're talking about that maturity level. And then finally, that it will be personalized and purposeful, which is why we think that coaching is exactly the right intervention. So that's why Optify brings coaching, that, that beautiful um, intervention of coaching and technology to make it scalable so you can mature the function in your organization to organizations. Um, and we're really excited about the work we do. So if there's any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. And Pam, maybe you want to put up the slide with our emails in case anybody yeah. wants to learn more about what we've talked about or uh, refute our, um, our thinking, uh, which we always appreciate. We love to hear other perspectives and also love to hear what's working for you. And the last question I'd leave you with is, you know, as you think about that maturity model, um, where do you assess your own organization? And um, are you where you want to be? And is there a, a desire to move along that maturity model? And for some organizations, the answer is no. But the question for some, you know, the, for some it's, yeah, we want to be that, that development, that um, developmental organization that's intentionally a learning culture. And so how do we get there? Um, so might be just a great sense of reflection for yourself. Pam, any last words from you? Uh, no, we just appreciate you hanging out during your lunchtime if, it, if you're on the East Coast and maybe it's morning breakfast time out on the West Coast, but appreciate you spending time with us. And um, we love to have conversations. We learn from every client that we work with. And um, so we can, we can sort of geek out on this topic of learning and development. And if anyone is, is interested, you can see our contact information here um, to, uh, to, to have a conversation, even if it's just to brainstorm or talk through some of your ideas or any ideas that were sort of sparked from this conversation. But thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much. It was great to, uh, to chat with you. Any last?